is the Microsoft Pore View. So what I want you to understand is the handshake. So for those of you who are new into tech, what this means is that you would have to go back and ask yourself, do I want to focus my career on data security? And if data security is not what you want to do, you might stay through the class just because no knowledge is wrong. But what it will mean is that you need to define what do I want to do in tech because tech is broad. Tech is vast. There's so much in tech. You can be a system admin. You can be a support person. You can be an identity. Tech is deep. So you want to know what you want to do in technology. Uh, and so it's very important that you understand what you want to do in tech. So why I'm putting this out here is that a lot of information are online and people are learning technology and you just find them continuously learning. They're not able to utilize what they've learned and they kind of feel frustrated is because you haven't done the first thing when you transition into tech ask yourself which pathway do i want to settle and build so that's for those of you who have no experience in tech or you're just dabbling into tech you need to while you are learning this ask yourself is this what i want to do now for those of you who are already in tech this is focused on data security and in data security we're talking about data in all aspects the information you have collected what you want to do with it then the regulatory bodies that you need to adhere to what you want to do with it. Now, for those of you who want to take out this, take what you have learned and now use it to apply in your CV like Miriam to say, I want to be employable. The good thing with this is that you are now narrowing down data security to a niche or to a, what we call a cloud service provider. Like we all know there are different cloud service provider. And the truth is you cannot, you can be, a, you can be, in a particular pathway, but you're not a subject matter expert. So when you become a subject matter expert, that's what, what that means is that you have tied yourself to a particular niche. So this course is tying you to Microsoft Purview so that you can become a subject matter expert. So when you're talking about data security and governance, you're not, only, you're not just speaking to the general words, you're tying it to Purview. So if a company, for instance, is recruiting for data security because you're saying I have experience using Microsoft Purview and that company has Microsoft 365 or Microsoft Purview, you tend to stand a better chance than somebody else because now you've narrowed down your niche to a particular cloud service provider. And that's how we teach technology, because at the end of the day, you want to use it, you want to be employable. And to be employable, you need to be able to use the tools that organization is using. So one of Microsoft's tool for ensuring data security, governance and compliance is the Microsoft Purview. And once you are able to use it, you become an information protection and compliance administrator. I don't know if that has helped people to begin to put things into context for them. And so this course is focused on getting you to have skills that will allow you to use Microsoft Purview um, to do data security, data investigations, uh, meet regulatory compliance, safeguard an organization's data effectively. And you will learn how to implement information protection, implement data loss prevention, as you've seen in the screen, audit, e-discovery, e-privacy, and insider risk management. Now, Ideally, you should have some prerequisite before doing this course. You should have already um, known how to work with Microsoft 365. But I can tell you categorically that if you don't know, that's fine. What will happen is that you, you would spend more time navigating around the M365 portal. Trust me, I've spent 10 years with Microsoft and I still navigate like i still take my time but because i have experience i might know that okay this is where this thing needs to be because the truth is the ui ux the interface of all these platforms keep changing so there's no hard or fast like you don't know it now that's fine understand the concept and as you familiarize with the platform you will know how to um, use it or know where certain keys are now what i want everybody to do if you're on your phone you can still do this is to go to um i'm going to drop this in the chat we have to create your profile on the microsoft learn copy so i can drop it in the chat so that those who are with phone can can um so that phone can easily click on it so we're going to go to microsoft learn and you're all going to click and create your profile now for those of you some of you might already have um a profile 
on Microsoft Learn. Now, if you already have a profile on Microsoft Learn, just navigate to where you have the SC400. But if you don't have, please click on the chat and click on the Microsoft Learn link. I'm going to share back my screen now. So that Do I have everybody doing that now? Now, the reason for the Microsoft Learn is that that's the material that we're using so that you can navigate with us as we go through the course. So once you go to Microsoft Learn, search for SC400. Please let me know that you can see my screen. If you're Microsoft, if you don't have an account on Microsoft Learn, first of all, please create an account. But if you have an account on Microsoft Learn, search for SC400 and we will start. And that's what we're going to use throughout the, the course. You might, just, you might want to click on this link. I think that's the beginning page you're looking for. I just put it on the chat. Create an account. Then creating an account doesn't mean you need to create a new email. If you Even if you have a Gmail account, just say create an account. Once you put your Gmail, it will make it a Microsoft account. So you'll be able to use your Gmail account. So it's not necessarily requiring you to have a new email address. For those of you who have never used, um, 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 for those of you who have never used Microsoft Learn, right? For those of you who have used it, I'm sure you're familiar with what I'm saying. So just navigate to SC400. I'm trying to browse to the exact beginning page so that that will help everybody. Sorry, because I've used this over and over and over. You're not taking me. So thank you so much, whoever that was. Thank you. I just opened it now and I can't find it again. So please just click on the link dropped by Jonathan. It will land you to the exact page. Oh. All right, so this is how you should be seeing it. If you're just using Microsoft Learn for the first time, okay? And then this is it. this is where we're starting from. Right, um, it's showing continue for me because I've already started using it. So your own would have the um, implement information protection. And the reason is that so that from, to, from today, at your own convenience, you'll be reading and going through and it will be keeping a record and you'll be earning your badges from Microsoft as you learn. And then in some scenarios, it will put um, um, activities for you to do in the Microsoft Learn. So it's very important. Even though I'm using a slide, it's just the same thing. It's a Microsoft Learn on a slide that I'm using, but that's it. So please follow the Microsoft Learn. It will help you also see your track, how you're flowing while we're doing this. Okay. Any questions so far, please, as we progress? Also, um, in the Discord channel during the week, I will drop the environment for the labs for us. Um, Microsoft used to give us a development platform which they've taken away. So there are a couple of ways we want to play around the lab so that we can still use it. So I will be dropping that later today um, for those of us, for all of us to start processing it, right? Any questions before we hit the ground running? It's important that we do all of this just so that we can manage everybody's expectation as we flow in. At the end of the day, you can become Microsoft certified with this program that we're doing. Now, for those of you who did not join the onboarding class, at the onboarding class, we said that if you have 100% participation, and um, I can't remember what the other criteria is, we would see how to make provision for you exam vouchers, right, to write the exam. And beyond that, for me, security, for as many people that want to write the exam, we would go through, even after the six weeks training, we would have refreshers course where we just sit together and practice it together um, so that we can write the exam, right? I don't mind having those extra classes for those who are very sure that they want to write this um, and they want to use it and progress with it. I'm happy to have extra classes where we just revise the um, 
exam questions that we have and then get familiar with how the questions are so that you can in your certification. Um, OK. Are you excited? Is this what you expected? OK, so let's start. Please, I would like my class to be very interactive. That's why I'm not a fan of virtual class because in virtual class, I don't get to see my students. I don't get to see their faces. Um, I like to keep conversations interactive. So please, please, please. If you're raising your hand, I'm not seeing right. or mute yourself. Hi. Yes. So I don't I don't know, maybe because I joined the group. I joined the group um, as a guest. I could not access my chat box here. I so you're not seeing you're not like seeing what we're dropping in the chat. Yes, yes, I'm not seeing what what is being dropped in the chat, but I can see okay, your no, screen. No problem. I, I would plead. Ask. It's fine. I will. I'll plead with Jonathan to help me drop it in the Discord channel. Can you go? To, are you on the Discord channel? Thank you. Yes, yes Jonathan, please okay. help me drop this link on the Discord channel too. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's make progress. Um. Yeah, please let me know when you're seeing implement information protection in Microsoft Purview. That's what I'm displaying now. Let me know if you're seeing that. Yes, yes. OK, quick recap. What did I say Microsoft Purview is for those who joined the class? Two people should answer. I can't see fingers raised, so unmute yourself. I will give. 50% voucher for this for people who can answer this because it means that you listen. Two people. Okay, okay. so the Microsoft Purview is um, something like used to manage data in the Microsoft portal, Microsoft 365 portal, data management solution. Who else wants to go? Is when you're all done, I will know. I will say who got it and who not got, who did not get it. So don't don't bear with me. Who else wants to go? Hi, good morning. It's Ayo speaking. Yeah. Um, I would say it's more of a cloud platform that helps to provide governance to manage Windows environments on prem and also on the cloud. So it acts as a software as a service um, platform, integrating across all its. Um, solutions to help you manage and govern data security and uh, compliance also thank you who else wants to go i want to go please uh, okay so microsoft purview is um a microsoft solution for governance and uh it can be used to to manage data ensure compliance of data on um both on cloud and can also be used on on-prem as well. Yeah, so uh, you can use it to manage um, um, client's data from where you got it up until when you decide to to do it with it. Just general data management and um, security. Okay. Yeah, Who else wants you. to go? The last person. Who else wants to go? That's four. I'll so I'll like, give you fifty. I'd say. Yeah? This is Kelly Chukwu Brown speaking. Yes, please. It's a, it's, a, it's a tool that provides a, a, a data data governance and, and a solutions. Uh, it's a tool that pro, that provides data data governance and and, and data protection. All right. On the microphone on, on the Microsoft platform. Yes, thank you. So you're correct, but it's very important that you mention Microsoft because it's not just. Microsoft Purview is Microsoft's own tool, right? You might find another um, solution provider with them, but the good thing is that Microsoft Purview also can allow you to do what we call, a, you can extend your other cloud service providers um, information. And I'll, I don't want to make this class too deep, but when we begin to look at things like using Microsoft Purview for containers and um, Databricks and the rest, you, you can extend your security posture and compliance to other cloud provider platforms, ingest your data into Sentinel and Microsoft Purview can help you do some form of governance there, but that's not to not to cause confusion for our beginners. But yes, Microsoft Purview is a SaaS solution. It's Microsoft's own solution that allows you to do data protection, 
data security and data governance. The whole data life cycle in your environment, especially if you're using Microsoft 365, can be managed using Microsoft PowerView. Right, so we'll quickly look at um, these outlines, you know, information protection. So when we say information protection, when we started our career small force, that's what is information security that you used to even call what everybody has, what has grown today and become um, cyber security. Um, so I, when people come and say, I want to do cyber security, I used to tell them, it's okay, it's a buzzword that is ruining. However, it starts from your information and information security that became cyber security, right? So um, we're still looking at information because information is data. And so Microsoft says, we'll be looking at your information protection in purview, how you will classify data because you want to protect them and govern them. Now, we're breaking it down to say how you will create sensitive information types because you have different types of data. So it's very important you classify this data um, and then the different types of <coughs> encryption levels that you have in order to protect the data. Um, I want to believe that some of us have encryption. Now, this is one of the ways I learn when I see something that is new to me because I don't want to miss out the class. I quickly notice. So for those of you who are new in tech, if the word encryption sounds new to you, note it down. Encryption is one of the ways that you use to protect information. So today, when you are browsing online, right, for you, all you know is that you are putting your username and password on an application. Now, for that username and password to pass through your phone, pass through internet, if you're using MTN data, using Airtel, using Glow, using Vodacom, whatever, and transmit and go to some server somewhere, pass that information, and it's not compromised because it's been encrypted in some form of way, and there's been some key exchange, right? So, what's like this? We might not be explaining them word for word in classes, but once you see anything that is new to you for newbies, I recommend that you note it down so that you can go and read and understand the concepts behind those kind of words. So we'll be describing the Microsoft 365 encryption types um, and how you will deploy the message encryption in PowerView. We'll create and manage sensitivity labels. So when we talk about sensitivity labels, we're explaining what that means, how you remember you have created and managed your sensitive information tabs. Now you want to also create labels that we match them in poor view. And we also want to now apply these sensitivity labels. When we say sensitivity labels, what are we referring to? Your information is in different category and how sensitive are they determines how much you want to protect them, right? So, um, your, for those of you who are married, your inter, things like international passport, you don't leave your children to keep their passports by themselves, except your children are quite old, right? So what do you do? You take those passports and you keep them. In fact, in some instances, if it is the father that is more organized or the mother, whichever parent is more organized, that person that you find that keeps all this kind of sensitive information. Why? Because your international passport is classified as a sensitive information. But your children's drawing, if your children like to do arts and craft, or if they go to um, if it's church, if it's school, and they finish drawing and they come home with those drawings, do you worry about where you keep them? No, because that data, as much as it's data, is schoolwork, it's not classified as sensitive. So you allow the children to decide where they keep them and play. So when your child comes and say, Mommy, I'm looking for my drawing book, you're like, leave me alone, go and find your drawing book. Because you didn't bother, you didn't bother about where it can be kept, because for you, it's not a big deal. It's not a sensitive information. So you didn't spend time worrying about how you guys can protect that information or keep it safe. In your, in your understanding, you have classified it as something that can be handled by your child at their level. So in that kind of level, that's what we do too in the corporate environment with data. We classify information, what's important, what's sensitive, what should go to everybody, what should not go to everybody. Um, so we'll be discussing this kind of information and the whole life cycle, why it's important, how Microsoft approaches information um, in protection and the data life. So when we say data life cycle, what do we mean? From when data is generated to how data is used and processed to how data is expunged out of the system. So I give an example. Your child goes to school today. They have arts and crafts in school. The child does that arts and craft brings it home, shows you, you're like, I'm proud of you, good job, and then you move on. And then your child comes tomorrow and says, mommy, I'm looking for that my book. And you're like, what do you want me to do? I don't know where it is. And your child is feeling crying and all of that. What's happened? Probably your house help self has even swept it and thrown away because in their brain, 
This is just um, um, Susan trying to color is jaga jaga. It's not important, but to Susan, that data was important, but to your household, that was not an important data. And so the whole life cycle of that data from when it was generated in school to when your house self swept the house and threw it away, you had no clue, no visibility as mommy or daddy. And it did not matter to you because you did not classify it as an important data to your household. However, for your international passport, what do you do? You take it, they come back, even when you have kids who probably are in an age where they needed to take their passport to go and do the oh, they went for jam. So they took it as their means of ID. As soon as they come back, what do you say? Please, can I have your passport before you tell me you don't know where you kept it? And so you take that passport well, and you take it to your room and probably you have a file or a cabinet and then you keep it there. And so what you are doing is that the life cycle of that data, you are putting a process around it because you want to know where it is. You want to know who has access to it. You want to know who is requesting for access at any point in time. It's that same concept when it comes to data security. The only difference is that you're going to now learn how PowerView does it, but that's the same concept. You want to define key terms that are associated with Microsoft information protection. So the terminologies that we use when we're using Microsoft protection, oh, private, confidential, sensitive and um, uh, protected. You want to get familiar with these terms because they are also useful throughout the life cycle. And you want to identify the solutions that comprise information and data life cycle in Microsoft 365. So if everything I've explained is what we want to do, using the example of a child called Susan at home who went to school and did a coloring and an art and brought it home, and mommy and daddy can't explain to Susan by the next day where her coloring and art is because you know the house help has cleaned and has trashed it and nobody knows in fact mommy and daddy don't even know that the house help has trashed it but the house help has trashed um, susan's coloring and susan is upset looking for her data right using that uh, we have categorized four key elements that you need to know when you are working with data one you want to know your data you want to understand where your data exists and the landscape and how it moves across the environment. So today, for those of you who are new to technology, we have what we call cloud and we have what we call on-prem. Before the internet became a big thing, for those of you who are new to tech, I'm taking it this way. Before the internet became a big deal, what used to happen was companies would set up a room and put in a box called servers there and create information on those boxes that their staffs will interact with and those information were data right so take for instance banking you would go into the bank and you would say my name is joy i have this is my bank account and i'm expected to see hundred thousand the reason why the bank can tell you that is because they have created that data repository somewhere now as cloud came and internet came organizations began to find out that if I created a room and I put information inside this room and I began to manage this information, it meant I needed to worry about power, electricity, security. And when many businesses were trying to look at their business landscape as to is this a prof let's focus on our core profit. They said, why are we worrying about infrastructure? Let's go to the cloud providers. There were companies that had invested in those rooms invested in security, invested in those boxes that we call server. And all they will do is because of you have internet connectivity, they will give you access to those things for you to be able to do. So as a business, I'm Conga, I'm Jumia. All I want to worry about is people logging into my portal, putting goods, selling the goods. I put my margin, I make it. So I make the portal available. I don't want to worry about where that thing is sitting on. So I want to invest my marketing time and resources in making sure that my Jumia portal is up and running so that people can transact businesses and I can make profit. But where that thing is sitting, I don't want someone to come and tell me, Oga, never carry light, so generate or no they own. Now why the server no come on and customers cannot transact? So I go to a cloud service provider and say, give me XYZ server, let me worry about my business. So that's what brought into the evolution of cloud. And I'm taking my time to explain this for those of you who are new into tech. So when you see cloud today and you have never experienced an organization that had an on-prem environment, you begin to wonder why. So in knowing your data, you want to, if you're working for an organization, know, do we have data that is in the scenario I just painted on-prem? So data that the company owns where they keep it, we call it 
on-prem and data that the company doesn't own where they keep the data they are just consuming the service the data is still their own but they don't own that whole infrastructure is cloud now for some organizations they keep data both on-prem and in the cloud and that's what we call hybrid so are you seeing the terminologies so for those of you who are new these are the kind of terminologies that you need to get familiar with so when you want to know your data you want to say where is my information my information is on-prem okay our type of business this is what we do we are a health care facility or let me take it now we are a hospital so where do we keep data our website people go to our website and they apply for a form that form where is it keeping that information is keeping it on the database of the website where is the website the website is hosted by a cloud provider that's data oh we are a hospital when staff when patients come in we open a file for them a paper file we give them paper they fill their details we carry the paper to an office and we put it so we have data in cabinets in the office we are a hospital we open a system and we put their information on the system and so that information that we put on the system does it save on that system or does it save to a central repository that is knowing your data so in data protection you want to know my data what type of data am i dealing with and i just gave you an example in the house of mr and mrs a their children go to school and deal with different types of school work that is data as parents they deal with different types of um utility bills that come in um, school children information that come in health health documentation that come in that is data so once you know your data you have begun your process to managing information now the next thing you want to do is protect your data because now that you know the kind of data that you use you want to protect it and in protecting your data you want to begin to do things like who should assess it how should i encrypt it how should i mark it so that i will know that this one is sensitive so Susan came back from school, showed mommy her coloring. Mommy said it was wonderful. That's data. But in mommy's head, it wasn't something that was valuable. So mommy didn't bother about it when Susan left it on the table. The house help came, was cleaning, saw Jaga Jaga, and felt this thing is not worthy to the house, threw it in the dustbin. So Susan's data was not protected. Susan's schoolwork was not protected. It doesn't mean that it's a wrong thing, but in the house, because they have classified that data as not important nothing on that data was kept for any other person who saw that data to know what to do for it so the general perception of the house is that this is jaga jaga we throw jaga jaga in the dustbin so there's no form of protection so when you know your data you can now know how to protect your data and when you protect your data what you have done is that you have prevented data loss so if mommy has seen susan's jaga jaga and said no this thing is important to susan and it is something that susan will need after today so she takes it and she probably keeps it in a file or she takes it and she keeps it in a shelf or she calls susan and, and calls the house up and say this thing here don't touch it she has protected it so what would happen the house help will not take that jaga jaga data and trash it and that way they will lose the data and Susan will still see her data when she comes the next day saying, mommy, I need my data. Or even if she comes and she didn't sit on the table and say, mommy, I'm, I need my, my schoolwork. Mommy will say, oh, it's fine. I kept it in the top cabinet and get it for her. So when we know our data, we can protect our data. And when we protect our data, we can prevent our data from being lost. We can even prevent who has access to it. We can prevent accidental, accidental deletion or use. And then that help us to now know whether we need to retain it. So maybe Susan needed that artwork for school the next day. 
maybe the school was go home, show your parents, get your parents to do X, Y, Z and bring it. So my son is involved in they do um, safety health day. Anytime they do safety health day at school where they teach them about their body, how to stay safe, how to protect themselves. When they come home, they expect us parents to interact with them to confirm that they understand this. And for the school to know that as a parent you were involved, they expect you to sign. So the next day your child is taking a signed copy <coughs> of that um, of that um, information around safety of your body, yourself online, and taking it to school. Now, if my son comes home with that kind of data and we finish looking at it and he doesn't keep it well and it is trashed, he will not be able to take that data back to school, right? However, when he takes it to school and they are done and he comes home, depending on how we see that, or if we feel it's not valuable to us or we feel that there are too much paper, what we need to do is begin to say, when do we get rid of this paper? This morning, my son likes to draw and I had a pile of drawing on the table. I said, go and put it because we have created a folder where we keep all his drawing. And I just passed recently and I saw that that bag was already full. And I said to myself, it's time to, you know, declutter this place. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go into that bag and I'm going to know the data that is inside there. I'm going to classify those data and I'm going to put the ones that don't need to be deleted and the ones that can be deleted or the ones that can be reused. So what I'm doing is that I'm putting some form of governance around that data. Are we cleared? Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. Have I made sense? Have I made yeah. sense? Yes. 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 Hello. Now, yes, can you yes. um come again in the govern your data area part, please, ma? Good. I now know what my data is. I have put certain things in place that will protect my data, and because I have protected my data, my data will be prevented from loss. However. If I don't put some form of governance, what will happen is my data will keep growing and growing and growing. Or my data would grow to a point that I will not know who has access to what. So I need to be able to say that, oh, I'm creating data now of patients. I have opened a hospital and patients are now coming and we are collecting patients information. And yes, we have said that nobody should be able to log in unless you have a username and password. So all the nurses have been given username and password and they can log in. However, I have not come back to say if all the nurses are logging in with username and password to and when they collect their patients data, it goes here. What happens to when we begin to collect data for people who have sensitive information like HIV, sensitive information like um, um, uh, um, DNA results? When we begin to collect all this kind of information, remember, I'm knowing my data now and I'm classifying them. How do I ensure that just because you are a nurse, you now have access there? And you know that, that because you are a nurse in the hospital does not automatically give you the right to have access to certain patients record. Certain patients record is based on access level. There are certain patients record that should not be given to certain people. So you want to build some form of governance around your data. Who should have access? How long should this data be kept here? Where should we store it? How much information should we give out when somebody comes and says, Oh, we're doing an investigation on this person and we need this set of information. How much can I give away? How much information do I have? How much information should I keep? Oh, we are collecting this. We don't even need this information, but why are we collecting it? The ability to be able to create a process around this, your data that you now know is governance. Has that clarified for the person who asked? Yes, ma. Thank you, ma. Thank you. Now, how do we manage these four things around information protect protection? We need something. You can see that it is too much activity happening. How do you now know what you are doing? How do you take it and put it in an organization? I just use a home, so it's easy. You, your family, your children. Imagine an organization. There's HR, there's legal, there's security, there's IT, there's uh, 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 internal control. There's all these procurements. How do you, all these people are 
chunking data on a daily basis. How are you going to be able to know them, protect, prevent, build a governance around them? You need something that is intelligent. And so that intelligent platform that can allow you have a unified approach that will provide automatic kind of classification, policy management, analytics and insight, and for that integration with other platform is where the Microsoft Purview comes into play. Are we good? So when you know yeah, your data, no. yeah, your data has different types of sensitivity. So when you know your data, data classification concept would apply to one of the following to your data. So I want to classify my data. I've known my data. I now need to classify my data. We say that in data classification, there are different concepts. So you can either apply your data, you can either classify your data using any of these concepts or using more than one. So I can classify my data using sensitivity. I can say, I want to classify my data by their sensitivity. Oh, um, I'm collecting genotype, right? Genotypes are sensitive. Oh, I'm collecting eye color. To us, yes, eye color is a, a, is a, is a personal information, but it's okay, it might not be sensitive. Oh, I'm collecting hobbies. What are your hobbies? Mm, it's an information we've collected, but it's okay if people know that you like to play ball and you don't like to play ball. Versus if people know that you are you are a particular genotype that there's a bias on that genotype or a particular genotype that can create some form of wrong bias about you. So we want to classify genotype as a sensitive type. So in our classification, we can use sensitivity. We can also use what we call trainable classifiers where we train the data. The system will say, this kind of information, because of where it's being used, it automatically trains it and calls it sensitive. So most times you see that in financial institutions and also in health sectors. Card, for many of you, when you take your ATM card, all you just know is that your ATM has some long numbers. For those of you who have really done tech in the financial sector, you will know that the first digit of every card you have automatically tells me who the card provider is. If I see five, I know that either you have Visa card. If I see this, I know you have MasterCard. If I see this, I know you have Vev. I'm sure many of you didn't know that. But for you, if you're not in the financial sector side of things, all you know is that there are long numbers. And those long numbers, we call them PAN in the tech world. But in data classification, because depending on the financial provider, that's, it has a expression. So once he sees this, he knows that this is a Visa card or this is a debit card or, or um, ATM, it's some form of ATM card. Well, we call it ATM Nigeria. They're not called it. Is that debit card or credit card? Some form of card. And so you can have trainable classifiers that just come to your environment and scan your data. And based on how we see your data being used, it would classify them for you without necessarily you coming out to say, oh, this is a sensitive. So the first one, which is sensitive information type, is you expressly saying this kind of data are this. The trainable classifiers come, you activate them in your environment, and they come and use, look at the way data is being used and do some form of classification. Then you have labels. Labels are, you also come and label anything that enters here automatically is sensitive. So for instance, again, in the health sector, if you go to lab automatically, if you see some, have you gone to some environments where they will say nobody um, um, unauthorized, like what are the words they use? They say um, um, only authorized to X, Y, Z. So even within the organization, unless you have certain kind of access, you might not even be able to penetrate there. That place has been labeled sensitive. That's a form of classification. And then we also use policies. So policy will say, I'm trying to look for something about the policy. Uh, policy will say that, um, don't talk to strangers. It's, it's not really applicable. I'm just trying to look for something off my head. You tell your children, don't talk to strangers. Right. Um, 
what you have done is that you have classified some kind of human beings as strangers and you've given your children a policy that says that they should not talk to strangers so something of that is your a policy that will enable you to be able to put some form of classification on data that's where policy so in data classification you can have any of these concepts right on your data or you can have one or you can have all of them being used on your data so knowing your data requires some form of classification that's the summary when you know your data just knowing your data does you no know good now okay i know that we collect people's name email date of birth uh -huh. when you say you know your data what else but we now have to classify them so that we can know that this is the kind of data that we collect or oh, we collect people's name age um um date of birth uh passport number okay these kind of data are classified as pii and the gdpr says that when you collect pii do abcd now you will see how all of those things handshake but once you classify your data once you know your data sorry it enables you to classify it so that you can be able to go to the next stage now in information protection we want to protect our data but you can't protect what you don't know where it resides. And that's why it's important that once we have known our data and classified them, we want to know where do these data sit. So I'd already explained to you what on-premise means. Once again, if you are new in tech, two people, um, I'm not giving you voucher. I would give you, I won't give you anything for this one. I just want to know if you know it. Can you explain what I mean by on-premise? When we say on-premise, when we use the word on-premise, what does it mean? If people don't answer this one, that means it's only gift people want in this class. I'll report people to the founders. Ah, my, my class people, uh, they only, they only speak when I give you. them gifts. Well, Hello, I'm, I think I'm what you say about on-premise. On-premise um, about uh, when um, a company saves it in a room. Ma, are you there? Okay, uh, you like to, you like to, your type of person, you the person went for school, they cram and pull. Hello? Uh -uh. <laughs> An on-prem on environment is where the company has its IT infrastructure on their company premise or let's say around. Exactly. So an on-prem means that the company is responsible whether direct or indirectly for its own data so they could be they could be outsourcing the location but the company is the one worrying about the server the storage everything is about the company needs to know okay we need um, a server with 100 gig and that 100 gig server we need an sql database and this company has to set that environment up and manage where that environment is so that's what we call on-premise so most times when technology started people used to put it in the same building of their office as technology began to evolve people took it to what we call colocation centers and as technology has now evolved we've moved to the cloud so yes on-premise data still exists today for many companies especially even in africa lots of on-premise data exists because we're still learning and unlearning and we're still evolving and even outside in europe i have clients who still use on-prem data so on-prem data exists now, Office apps across platform. What remember, we're studying about Microsoft technology, so there are lots of Microsoft, Microsoft you'll be seeing. Now, when we say Office apps across platforms, we're referring to Microsoft Word, Excel, Access, PowerPoint, Publisher. So if you go to your Office apps, you see that when you install Microsoft Office, you used to install so many other things. Or you just, most times what you focus on is either Word or Excel. But when you look at when you're installing Office app, install so many things, Office, um, sorry, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, Publisher, there's so many other things. So all of those platforms are places where your data exists. SharePoint sites, Teams, Office 365 groups. Now for those who are newbie, all of these things you see on the screen are different repositories where Microsoft customers who are using Microsoft platforms are keeping data. So for you to understand this very well, just imagine your Gmail. If you go to your Gmail today, many of you are only focused on your Gmail. But if you go to the top right side of your Gmail, you will see that you have so many other apps that Google has given you. Google Meet, <coughs> Google Drive google photos 
all of those things fall under this place we call the office apps across platforms so google's own free version is what many of you hear but many of you all you just did was created gmail but what google calls it is the google workspace that's why if you go to the top right corner of your gmail you will see so many applications there that google has given you but many of you don't use it right so you don't pay attention to it but that's called google workspace and you are only using your gmail which is your email account right so for if you're a newbie it's, it's the same thing for those who are using microsoft microsoft has given them different solutions that they are using some organizations will have one some organizations will have two some organizations will have everything right um and but what we're saying here is that when you know your data for you to protect your data you need to know where your data is stored and these are different places where your data can be stored sharepoint site teams groups exchange online exchange online is microsoft's place for email so you are calling yours um, on gmail um sorry on google gmail they call it um exchange online and your sharepoint online your power bi so for those of you um who understand why people like madam franca want and um online can want to still know about securities that they are power bi experts they deal with data they will have use cases where they are trying to be asking them certain things around the data the security and the governance and this is why what they are learning today will help them and um, your power your power bi is plugging into so many data sources to pull out information and then you have the non microsoft cloud and SaaS app so if you remember when we started talking where i said that microsoft has a way that it has also allowed itself to extend to platforms that it's not microsoft to still give you that security so information protection can integrate into different apps that we have seen here just so that you can protect them and speed up a bit right now once you know your data you've protect you want to you know prevent data loss and how do you prevent data loss you prevent data loss by securing your data right so one of the ways you can secure your data is by putting conditional access to those sensitive data so if you remember when we said you know your data we said one of the ways you can classify your data is by doing sensitivity types so if you say this is a confidential information right you tell your children don't say this thing out it's confidential right you also want to put conditions and say don't so there's something i do with my kids you know they've taught us that we should start teaching our children about their body about protecting because lots of molestation starts from in-house so anytime i teach my kids about it one of the things i say to them is i say when we talk about oh your body how is important to you then i say to them you are allowed to disobey and in, in you are allowed to disobey an adult once the adult is telling you to do something bad because what we found out so many times is that we teach our children how to be obedient respectful and so that's why when the manipulators come to them and they are manipulating them you know what they tell them if you tell mommy and daddy they'll be upset with you you know this is the bad so the manipulators are telling your children that what they have told them to do is bad but if you tell mommy and daddy they'll be upset now because your kids know that yes mommy and daddy will be upset your kids now don't tell you so because their body parts are sensitive so i've classified that information as sensitive and i have classified that my kids not doing doing something bad would upset me however i have classified that that data should have a condition so i say to them once an adult is telling you to do something bad please disobey the adult so it's the same thing with data you say if this person is not needed to have access to this data then don't give so that's where conditional access comes in or you walk in and say oh my name is joy i am the friend of adobe i would like to see her medical record the hospital will be looking at you. I don't understand. Say, yes, remember now that day she came here. It was two of us that came. I was the one who broke. Oh, let me switch it before Adobe will do blood of Jesus. Nothing will happen to me. So Adobe is my friend. Adobe takes me to the hospital. <laughs> and I'm in the hospital. Adobe comes and says, I'm the one that brought joy. Let me see what the result says. The hospital won't give because that's a sensitive information. And I have not divulged that my information should be given to my friend because she's the one that brought me to the hospital. But peradventure, if my husband comes, then they might say, okay, she's married. She says she's married, right? Um, so the condition statement allows them give that sensitive data to my husband, but not to my friend. 
So when we are securing data, we use things like conditional access to determine who should have access to an information. We also use data loss prevention actions to block. So we can also say if this happens, block. So we've had cases where, for instance, if I come to Nigeria to work, unfortunately, and as sad as it is, Nigeria has been flagged as a red red flag location. So for those of us who are from Nigeria who work in where I work, once we come to Nigeria, we can't work as much as we have a flexible working because Nigeria has been flagged red, right? Now, how will my organization know that I'm in Nigeria because of my IP address? So they will use a data loss prevention action to say, if the location is in this region, block. So there are certain things I cannot do the moment I land in Nigeria just because of Nigeria has been flagged as a red flag country, right? When it comes to data and sharing of data. So they use the, the data loss prevention action to block and I won't be able to do things I could have done even if I'm not work, um, um, in the office because my company has allowed us to work from anywhere. But unfortunately, I cannot work from that location. So those are ways that you can secure data. We also want to do encryption. So you want to say, even though Joy should have access to this data, I still want it to be encrypted. Paradventure. So I've worked for an organization where, may he so rest in peace, but how many of you can remember the saga that happened one time Access Bank had one town hall and people recorded what was said in the town hall and it was, it was all over social media. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the age brackets of here, but once upon a time, it, there was something like that, and there was a town hall that was had, and you know, um, the late MD had said some things, and, and and people had recorded it. It was a Zoom call, and had put it out there. It's the same thing with emails. I worked in an organization where emails were being sent out, and people would take that email and forward it to their family or forward it to the media. So what did they do? So even though everybody had to read that email, the organization still wanted that information to be confidential. So what would they do? They will encrypt it that you are reading it or you are seeing it, but you cannot print it, you cannot copy it, you cannot forward it, you cannot send it. So those are the ways we can secure data. So it's sensitive. Joy should see it, but Joy cannot forward it. She cannot print it. She cannot call it copy it, she cannot save it, she can only just see it and close it. Every time she wants to see it, she has to go into the email, open it or go into the drive, open it. But if she wants to forward it, copy it, um, save it, print it, it will not work. Those are what we do with encryption, right? We can also use certain policies. So you can say, it's okay if, almost like what I talked about, the location base, where you say, if this person is in this location, lock. You can also say, if this person is assessing this from their personal device, and the data is confidential, don't allow them save. So we, those are where policies come in place. We can create different policies that allow us to put certain form of restrictions, right? We can do business data separation on devices too. Um, you can say, I'm using my personal device, BYOD. So when people use their personal device and they read company emails, if personal device prevents screen grab, yes. DLP can allow you prevent screen capture, right? You just find yourself that you're doing screen grab is not working. You go to your Facebook, you do screen grab, it works. You go to your Instagram, you do screen grab, you, you come to your office email, open a particular email that, that has been classified with a particular label. And when you're doing screen grab, it's not working. And you'll be wondering whether something don't do your phone. Nothing is wrong with your phone. DLP policies allow us to put those kind of restrictions. Right. And then where you secure email with encryptions and permission, permissions, again, is who needs access and all of that. Um, so we can prevent data loss by securing our data um, and we can, why securing our data still enable productivity? One of the challenges that we've seen over the years, why many organizations don't want to put this kind of security is that people will say it will hamper my productivity so what do we do we allow where you can manually apply sensitive label so the policy can say okay you know what if we enforce it we might go and be enforcing something that is not as so the trainable classifier can say oh just because i saw joy right card debit card in her email i assumed that it was a card related data and meanwhile she was just calling it out 
oh, Adobe, please, um, the card information that we do, blah, 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 please send it to this, and it's automatically going to apply confidential. Meanwhile, the content of that email didn't have anything confidential, right? So what do we do? To enable productivity, there are times that we've said, depending on the organization use cases, we've said, let people manually apply their sensitive labels. But so what it can do is when you wanted to send, you would say, oh, Joy, you haven't applied a label, then I can now manually go and select um, um, public or select general because I know that it's, even though I had mentioned the word card in it, I have not necessarily put in a card detail, so it's not a confidential information. Um, and in trying to do this kind of manual classification, it can even show you tips, right? It can say, oh, you put card here, I think you should use confidential and then i'm the one that will say yes i use the word card does not necessarily mean no i want to use manual so there are ways to balance security and productivity when you're using microsoft purview that allows you to be able to allow people still do things manually um so that they their productivity is not hampered and things like even water mark so sometimes people might not see a label I'm, I'm sure you've gotten some documents. You see the watermark on it, confidential. For those in the legal industry, confidential. This, this, this. The reason why those visual markings are done is so that somebody will say, I don't know. I did not know it was confidential. So in certain instances, visual markings are used on sensitive documents so that it just calls out to somebody to say, this thing is confidential. So you don't have any excuse to have shared it or to have left it carelessly on the table and somebody else have seen. Um, Sorry, well, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. So what kind of uh, classification would you say a scenario maybe where um, you cannot access any other uh, website from a work computer or uh, whereby you cannot receive um, emails from external um, service provider, maybe something that has the, doesn't have the company's email address, would not go into any email that has to do with the company. What kind of protection is that? It's confidential, or, sorry, it's sensitive. So two things, if, if by design of that company, the kind of business they do, they don't want external people to send them email, so it's not that the thing is spoiled and then you just realize that you're not getting email. You're not saying, oh, maybe they put, you know, you, it's possible that something has happened on your email infrastructure. That's why you're not receiving email from outside to in. We call it inbound. But if I want to, in the context of what we're learning, let us take that, oh, you find yourself in an organization where I just noticed that if I'm trying to use my personal email to send myself something, it never comes in, right? Um could that be some form of data classification? Then your organization probably has a restriction where the kind of business that you do, you can never take inform. They never allow um, anything outside white listed domain. So there are certain people that will say anybody we're doing business with, we have entered business partnership with them, and so white list. So anybody that is not in this external domain white list can never send us an email. So that's called sensitive classification. So they have said our kind of business is very sensitive. We don't want to receive email from any other company except companies we have whitelisted. So maybe the type of business they do when they enter that business with you, the first thing they do is sit with you to get your domain, tell you that, okay, in this communication, only you can send us, non-external domains cannot send us. And then they go to their email infrastructure and they create a whitelist because they have classified their business as sensitive and information that they deal with as sensitive. So they don't want that information to be shared with any form of third party. So there Thank are two you. things here. If your email infrastructure is fine and is a business model, then those kind of things are classified as sensitive. Again, classification is unique to organization, unique to department. So happy birthday that HR will send to everybody. You understand, maybe like happy or happy Mother's Day. Uh, today is uh, Idel Fitri or today is public. You saw those kind of internal communications. An organization can say those things are what general public. So you can still carry a label, but you might carry public. However, if an organization is saying we are reducing salary and they know that we live in a world of social media, where staff can decide to take that information and go to social. How many times have you seen companies' conversations on Twitter? 
when I see them, I just laugh. I'm like, the organization wanted to send something like this. They didn't process it. Our staffs are going to be upset with this, and we might just have people that will take it out, right? They might probably even have a policy that say, do not share company information out, but they don't have a technology that can help them enforce that policy. So in those kind of instances, what you do, those kind of things, two things, you either have an, a manual where, when they were initiating that email, whoever, the person would have applied a manual label that says sensitive, and that sensitive will probably have a restriction policy that says, if sensitive, prevent copy, prevent forward, prevent save, prevent print. So we have use case. So in data security, it's that's why it's a skill set that is on high demand now because of how much we're seeing information leak. And it's a tedious work because you have to sit to understand how the business functions, what they do, what type of data. Remember, know your data. What type of data do you generate and process? And this data you generate and process, how do you communicate with it? Who communicates with it? All of these things fall into knowing, and that's when you start classifying. Once you have done the right classification, protecting and preventing it, for me, is one of the easiest side. I hope I've answered your question. Yes. Okay. Um, you also want to allow, even though you have encrypted uh, messages, for them to be searchable. And you also want to allow people to be able to open and share encrypted PDFs in Edge, in addition to Adobe Acrobat Reader. Right? Like all of these things are just improve productivity because once you have encrypted a file, most times it's very difficult to search the file because once you've encrypted it, again, um, for those who are new in tech, um, like I said, take encryption out and, and, and go and read about it. It's how you change. So if I want to encrypt this message, co-author and collaborate with sensitive documents. Once I encrypt it, what will happen is that if, Ada, if Adobe receives this message, when the message is passing, it will not come in co-author and collaborate. Even when Ada receives it, she needs to decrypt it for it to mean that when she receives it, it might just be in gibberish 1010s. But when she decrypts it with whatever method the both of us have agreed on how we want to decrypt messages, she'll be able to see that, oh, that's what I've said. Um, so encryption is just, you know how, I know how many of you remember the eye code, like there's something I do with my son, I say, I call it the mommy eyes, he called, well, he calls it the mommy eyes, um, so, and my parents did it to us, you go somewhere, once you look at your mom, right, you know what she's saying, oh, Joy, come and take food, if you look at your mom, you know whether you should eat or you know whether you should not eat, that's encryption, <laughs> so the ability to communicate without verbally saying something, without having to communicate in a particular way, or to be able to code language or encrypt a message in a way that can only be decrypted by the two people who have that communication so now once you have encrypted people cannot however people will say oh because you've encrypted all the messages when i need to search something on sharepoint i can't even see because they've been encrypted so there are ways to allow even if an, a message has been encrypted for it to be searched where it's not revealing the whole content we do all of these things just to relax um, sorry, to enable productivity even when you're enforcing security. Um, and this has evolved over the years. Um, these things were not possible like this. Okay, we have 30 more minutes. Now, once you have known your data, protected your data, prevented it from loss, you want to govern, right? And um, the way Microsoft would look at it is you want to streamline administration, right? Um, Again, like I said, who is using this data? Who has access to this data? What does this say? Um, my, um, CBM will say all financial transactions should, should be kept at least 10 years, right, of information. 10 years of financial transactions should be kept for every, every time they come to you, they want to see up to 10 years financial data. That's governance. So what you say to yourself is, if you are in the information protection and governance space for a bank, whether it is audit, whether it is control, whether it is in IT, what you want to do is say, okay, we are, these are transactions, they are storing it here. Like, who has access to it? Because the fact that you, you want to keep that data for 10 years, that's sensitive information. And so you want to know who can go to that place. So even though it is not data that we're using all the time, somebody can still go there and take, mother, how many times have you gone to your store? Your brain is telling you that you had five sardines and when you entered, there was only three. And you were like, no, I know we should have five. 
So what happened to the two? If you look around your governance process, you will find out that you did not pay attention because it means that somebody else has had access to your store and has taken. So while you were thinking that you're the only one who goes into your store, somebody else has come into your store. Probably you had a cousin that came to visit, did not know the house rules, went there, saw sardine, took it and used and you were fuming that in your budget, you're like, we have five sardine, now you have three. I'm just trying my best to use very day-to-day -day activities for you to see how data is managed. So what do you want to do? You want to streamline administration in governance. You want to say who needs to do what so that you can know how to put the whole right um, um, governance process around your data. You want to automate a skill. So you also don't want it to be manual. You want it to be that when it's needed, it can be skilled. So for instance, I can say, I can click here and it to say, Joy, you don't have access, but then it will give me a button where I can request for access. So at that point, when I say, I request, it will probably send an email to service desk or send an email to the data protection officer who will say, oh, Joy is requesting for this information. And then I can now say, where's your business justification and approve rather than make it. So while we are streamlining administration, we want to automate it and allow it to be able to scale up, you know, and put some workflows. When you do all of that around data governance, it makes life easy for you. So it's not just to come and say, oh, IT people are generating data, you don't have control. Governance should require that you should be able to request for um, have some automation. So if you look at the GDPR, the um, GDPR policy will say that if my data has been collected by XYZ organization, I can ask that, that organization purge my data after XYZ. So these are things where Purview allows you to be able to see that, oh, we are collecting this kind of data that GDPR says that the owner can access. So now this owner is asking us to purge. We want to prove to this owner that we have purged, that we have purged this kind of thing. Um, Purview has a way that we can work and the client can see that your data does not exist within this container that we have used it anymore. And we can use that as evidence to the clients to say in line with GDPR, we have adhered to that section. Any question? So now we're entering into classification, right? You want to classify your data. Now we're breaking it down. So the foundation is what we've seen. Those four pillars are what you do in data security. Now inside Know Your Data, remember, we want to start breaking it down. So we're looking at data classification. Um, so the overview is that you, um, again, I've, I've said some of these things, so I'm just going to run through it. Um, Sensitivity is how you classify your data and then you build labels, right? Um, you want to look at locations where em emails, documents, you know, some form of explorer, where do these informations exist, right? And do they have um, the labels that you have applied? Um, you also want to, okay. Let me just explain what this is. In Microsoft Purview, you will see what we call the Content Explorer, the Activity Explorer, the Sensitive Info Types, and the Trainable Classifiers. What this do for you in the Content Explorer, it will help you to be able to say, this location, do I have this type of content here? Right? So after I have classified, if I use my Content Explorer, I can see that, oh, I'm looking at emails, and I can see that I have sensitive information here. I have this type of label, or I have certain informations that have not been labeled. The Activity Explorer also does the same thing. It's just that they're in different context. Explorer is very specific to a location. So it's either I'm looking at documents, or I'm looking at SharePoint, or I'm looking at email. Why Activity Explorer is looking at things that people do. So you can just use the activities. People are sending and receiving emails, and they are going out without some form of labels or, or um, classification. Right, um, sensitive info types. We've talked about it over and over again. Just the different information types that you have based on the sensitive sensitivity levels that you have built. Trainable classifiers is that you enable it and say using is algorithm, is an artificial intelligence algorithm. It should go in there and identify content, you know, and come back to you to say these are the kind of content your people are. Doing. Most times, in most environments, we always, first of all, if we're doing a project, we always enable trainable classifiers because people will tell you they know the kind of data they are doing, but most times they don't know. So the trainable classifiers will go out and come back and say, this is the kind of information these people are using. You know? And that kind of, when you export that, you can sit down with the different stakeholders to say, this is the kind of data you are using. And they can say, oh, this kind of data, oh, we deal with um, 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 our clients, oh, this kind of data should be classified as sensitive. 
you know, we didn't even know that we collect this much information. You know, a business person might not even know that, oh, in, in HR, this is how much they collect from people when they are doing onboarding. And so the trainable classifier will see that this kind of information is there, people's genotype, people's, this, people's date of birth, people's, that all this kind of information is in the HR application and you can come back and you can say, oh, because we take this kind of information, GDPR says that we must be compliant to it X, Y, Z way, right? Okay. But, yeah, but you did not even know. So that's the value add of the trainable classifiers. It can go in and see data that you're using and classify it. Um, in information protection too, we have what we call auto labeling. So you can manually label and you can tell the system to automatically label. What we, what we typically do most times is to say, when you started your pilot, you take a group of departments or group of users, and then you get them to start using it. Once you want to roll out bankwide, there are certain things that automatically have to go into auto labeling. For instance, if you are in the bank and you have people in the card department, their everyday work requires them to talk about card requires them especially like i don't know how it's done but back in the days you have a department that is in the card business and you have a department that was in the it card and every time can that person please mute themselves thank you or somebody help me mute the person that is noisy um so those kind of departments 99 percent of the time their emails require them to share card details, PAN details, even though they have maxed it out. So the policy will say, if you want to communicate the PAN, put the first four, first four and the last six. But in data protection, you even want to still say that that's a sensitive information, right? So even though it's not the full PAN, you still want to say, you still want the system to know that this, you know, is a sensitive information. So those kind of Sorry, I think you're muted, please, Joyce. I think you're muted. Sorry, I think when the person was trying to help me mute everybody, somebody muted me. So I'll just, go, I'll, I'll go back a bit. Okay, just to summarize, I said sensitivity auto-labeling. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yes. Sensitivity auto-labeling refers to where we have seen that We've done our pilot, right? We've taken a group of people. We've tested these policies. They are working. However, there are still some use cases where we know that if we rely on users, we might just have data leak. So I gave an instance that in the banking industry, then there were departments that are called card services. Their job required that when you request for your ATM card, they're the ones that will interface with the company that produces the card. And so you will see them that they have to exchange card information. Now, the policy in that in by law by cbn law and the policy of that department's sop standard operating procedure is that they should never send the full pan so the staffs know they'll put four of the first and last of the six but i'm saying that even at that that's still a sensitive information so we can create auto labeling for those kind of use cases and say anytime you see card related enforce a label called sensitive or enforce a label called and, rem and just to add here, hold your touch. You can create your label as anything. Another company can choose to call their, their label confidential, um, sensitive, restricted. Whatever you choose to call your labels are based on your organization's nomenclature. So you will see when we go into the labs from next week, you will see um, private, general, those are you know, because once you look at it, it makes sense. But some, some companies have gone granular to create different types of labeling names based on how their businesses are, right? So auto-labeling allows you those kind of use cases to enforce those kind of policies. Um, <coughs> again, um, data life cycle, like we said, is how long should it stay? And um, what are the policies too? So you can, you don't want to worry yourself you have already said remember you have said that oh cbm for instance says keep 10 years and you don't want to as a compliance person be saying that so i have to remember after 10 years to come back here and tell them to push so you can create auto 
retention labor policies that say any data that is greater than 10 years old, of course, data that you have classified though, in a particular way should be purged. So that way you don't have to worry. Now, the reason why you're doing all of these things, you begin to see when we go into insider threats is that as a business, when somebody, when a hacker comes into your environment and is trying to gather information, the hacker is trying to go to as many places as possible. Most times, obsolete data is always forgotten and that's where hackers go and get as much information because most time because they are old data you don't pay attention to the access controls there you don't pay attention to the user permissions there meanwhile that place contains enough data that can give people so you want to create retention policies the same thing meeting notes people even in chats oh i remember in one time in my career you know i used to be in investigation in a particular industry and um, I felt bad for people who my investigation information would have to send them because I had to do my job. But I was amazed at how much people were seeing in company charts and they were forgetting that this was company system. And so when we would do investigations, we would pull out people that had said things in their chart that enabled us to be able to pinpoint them, <laughs> you know, as the ones who did things like that, you know. so. That's where kind of sense. So it's the same thing. If a hacker is coming into, he knows that oh, he can get here. So you see some organizations that will have policies around um, um, chats should not stay more than X Y Z period. Now it's not even because of investigation, but because of even keeping storage space. You don't want to keep data forever. But I'm, I'm just trying to see how sensitive information can be gotten from even as things as much as chat. And so organizations, because they know that is a two way thing, not necessarily because you are saying what can put you in trouble because you can keep an information there that somebody can come in um, that has hacked the system and can have access to it and you were just trying to make life easy so i said to her dad beg um I'm, I'm, they just called me now my, my daughter is ill i need to rush away but can you please just help me go this thing see the password to this thing you drop it in the chat and you don't delete those kind of things you know if a hacker comes to the environment and has access to those kind of things they have access to the password so there are so many use cases, and in order for organizations to give themselves that they are doing things right, they will put data lifecycle retention policies that say things like this should not stay X Y Z. Things like this should be purged after X Y Z period. Um, those are how we classify sensitive information. <coughs> Again, I explained to you the the classifiers. So the trainable classifiers. Now we're going bit by bit how Microsoft does this because that's the reality. If you go to an organization, you want to prove to them that you know how to to do this. So how many of you know what SharePoint is? Or rather, let me not say how many of you don't know what SharePoint is? Um, uh, I'm a beginner so in tech, so I don't know what SharePoint is. OK, good. So SharePoint is one of Microsoft's software as a service platform that is responsible for storing information. It allows you to be able to keep information. It allows you to, be able to also build sites, right? So um, we call it intranet, your local internet. So what you would call website. Website is what everybody sees. You want to have that kind of repository that keeps internal or company information. We call it intranet. And so your SharePoint tool allows you to be able to create web pages, right? What you people we call what you are familiar with in the non corporate world as websites. In the corporate people, we call them web pages. So you want to create different web pages, web pages for HR platform, web pages for office policies, and all of that. So your SharePoint libraries will always keep information. You always keep information. And so the trainable classifiers, like I said, can go in, do some crawling, you know, and find out, you know, what are the kind of policies that exist. So it would go in and then you keep it, you know, first time for like 12 days. And then it will just crawl and begin to see how you are interacting, looking at the information you are doing. And then it will collect this information into a folder um, and then start creating classifiers, right? And then those classifiers is what it will create. And then you will review. And when you review, you will test, you review, you test before you now create policies that you, you publish. Yeah. So trainable classifiers is one of the most simplest ways. If an organization is saying, ah, we don't have staff. 
So depending on your organization capacity, some organizations will, will put your DLP program, your data loss prevention program, and pull up people from different teams. Some organizations will say, we don't have that capacity. But if you are in governance, and you are the one that wants to drive this, you can say to them that, then let's turn on the trainable classifiers, right? Um, it's not making any configuration change. It's just going to learn your environment. So if you're in compliance pushing IT, and IT is saying, I cannot implement what I don't know. And the business is saying, we don't have any budget right now to fund to fund a data protection program. But you in compliance is seeing the risk and the gap. And you're saying, okay, these people are joking, but your organization already has the license. So there are two things. If your organization doesn't have the license, then you, your problem is too much. It means you have to build business case to get them to buy them. But let's assume your organization already has the E5 license and you're saying, why can't we do this? I'm seeing potential data breach here. I'm seeing us, um, have potential sanctions because we're dealing with so much information or you are the DPO of your organization and you're like, I cannot rely on people to fill a form and tell me when they are going to process a sensitive data. How do I know? You can now say, and we already have E5. What do you do? You build your business case and say, I need IT to turn on my trainable class, to turn on the trainable classifiers for us. And it will go in there study the whole environment, pull out, and then you can now start to review before you can come up and now create labels and say, okay, based on what it has seen, we can now create. So that's another good way to start so that where an organization is feeling like um, they don't have budget, if once they have the license, you can use trainable classifiers and that can tell you the kind of data that the organization is using. <coughs> and this is just explaining some of the things that it will do. It will see offensive languages, you will see so like again i said people who are in, using office environments and having certain conversations and forget themselves i always laugh at them because i'm like it can pick up all those kind of things where people use and i've been in situations where i've done investigation and people have been terminated because they've used several words that they shouldn't you know be using in the workplace and because we were doing certain for, for uh, investigations we were able to pick them up um so your trainable classifiers can allow you to see where people are using offensive languages, where people are, you know, where there are source codes, people have put source codes that you do not know, where people have used words, you know, threat, profanity, where you have CVs, all of these things. And these are the default classifiers that Microsoft has. You can also custom a classifier, right? That you can say, oh, I want, like I told you, I said every card has a reg expression way i think mastercard is five visa card is four i can't remember again so those kind of things you can now create them to say if you see this kind of um logic and pattern is a card um so classify it as this so you can create your own custom classifiers that you can push in into the trainable classifier so that you can pull out that report and start with it i encourage you know anybody who is in the compliance governance space and your organization already has e5 to tell them to do classifiers you know and the good thing of this is that even if your organization doesn't have e5 and so while you're trying to push management to invest and management saying there's no money you uh, but you people use microsoft 365 you can activate the one month trial enable your classifiers get out and when the one month trial expires and you 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 stop the trial you have data that you can work with i don't know if you guys get it so there, there are many ways to to do your job well so if you're saying my job is frustrating i know what i need to do but my organization doesn't have the budget that's one way you can do and trainable classifiers did not exist um, I can't remember when it came up. So back in the days when people like us did information protection, we struggled because you had to use your brain to create what was confidential. So there are many ways to just kickstart a DLP program. Don't just say, oh, we can't start it because management is not agreeing. Once you can build your business case and show a roadmap, so the roadmap can start. Let's start with trainable classifiers. Okay, we don't have E5 license. Let's activate the trial, use it for one month, extend the trial, and then get out data and then the reports we have can tell the organization how much information we have you can even see how much sensitive information you have that people are sending out that you didn't even know right 
and and that's what that you can see that the review will show you things so for instance in this review it's saying we have this amount of activities this amount were files created this amount were files copied to clipboard this amount were file printed you can get that kind of information right and so that can help you to begin to answer how much of our data is out there and which type of label should we use most because we're seeing that this kind of data is what is used you know, out there and how much data are people copying and sharing outside the organization. So this helps you build. So that business justification you're writing to the business to say, give me E5 and they're saying, we don't have it. Once you use this approach, you can sit and go back to them and say, this is what is going out and business will be like, wow. Or you can even match it to sanctions that you know ap apply to your type of industry. Say, okay, we're saying people send this kind of information out. So it means that, you know, we can be sanctioned that it that we haven't been sanctioned today does not mean we can't be sanctioned tomorrow. And so based on this, you know, I need this license, right? Um, so this is where the Content Explorer 2, where you can use the Content Explorer to also do some kind of search where you can say, I want to search for confidential label. So in this instance, this is a, a pen. Right for my my pen so that I can draw where I can find. So in this instance, you can see that this is a confidential label and you want to search for where confidential labels have been used across. The, so you can come to Contact Explorer and say, you can see here, it says all locations, SharePoint, and then you can now search there and it will pull up all the type of label, um, sorry, confidential data that have been used in SharePoint. It just gives you so you can say, oh, in SharePoint, this is the type of confidential data that we have. Any questions so far? Uh, yes, ma. Please, ma, what is E5? Oh, thank you. So Microsoft licensing has different category, right? Um, the Microsoft Power View automatically is available if your license type is called E5. Um, if it is E3, I think you can do some things, but you can't do so many. And if it is not E3 or E5, then you have to either buy it as an add-on. So when you're buying the Microsoft 365 license, you are buying a particular version. So depending on the version you have, you might not be able to do this. So while you're learning this, I'm just calling it out that you might go to your organization now and say, oh, I've learned Microsoft Power Your organization might not be using the license type that enables it. However, not to kill your joy, you can use trial and get information that can put business case forward on why they need to do this. For those who are in small organizations, the Microsoft Business Premium is what can allow you to do some form of information protection. I'm not sure if you can do trainable classifiers in premium, but like I said, if you use the <coughs> trial version and do the trainable classifiers, but premium allows you to do classification and protection. So you can now, once you have an idea of the type of data, now know how to create and um, recommend your sensitivity labels and protection, which is available on Microsoft Business Premium. That's for small business that are between one user to 300 users. But once you are both 300 users, Microsoft expects you to begin to use the Microsoft Enterprise version, which has the E3 or the E5. Does that help, Claire? So, you, so the trainable classifier is basically for Microsoft. Yeah, we're learning Microsoft Purview. That's what we're learning. So it's one of the features that is in Microsoft Purview. Did that help? So I'm saying that Microsoft Purview is saying to you that if you want to do DLP, remember it has told you to know your data protect. We're saying that for you to know your data. You need to engage people that are generating data. Now, people might not even know how much of data that they are generating, right? HR can just say, when people come, I give them this form to fill. And HR is not understanding the sensitivity of those things. Your, if you turn on trainable classifier in Microsoft Purview, it automatically scans your environment and can tell you where your data are that you can now use to say, oh, we are collecting people's age. We're collecting people's blood group. We're collecting people's this. And we didn't know that HR used to collect it, or we didn't know that um, um, this department used to collect it. And the 
governance policy, the um, sorry, regulatory body that govern our kind of business says that we should purge this kind of data X, Y, Z. So the training book classifier will give you an insight so that you can now know how to classify your data. So it's a cool feature that Microsoft has made available that you don't typically see. People just say, oh, I want to classify, but they don't know where to start. Okay, so you guys want me to go on. We're a bit behind because we did lots of knowing today, but I'm happy to push it another 30 minutes if you guys want to stay. <laughs> Plus, since I am the one who starts, who, what I mean is that people can be in the class, but even if I'm not there, then the class has really not started. So I'll make sure that as I'm coming in, I'm going to the Discord and saying I am now in the class so that everybody can know I'm there. Thank you so much for that feedback. And apologies for those who had to wait or miss out when we started. Okay, trust me, this is, you're new in tech. Um, you would struggle a bit with the terminologies, but trust me, what I would just recommend is push yourself extra and um, chat me up that you're new and we'll just get you to do Microsoft M MS 900. So you just be familiar with Microsoft platform. Um, you're not new in tech, but you're new in security. This is a good place to start. Um, even if you're not in the GRC part of security, like I said, you are in data security. This is one good place to start, especially with what AI is doing now. Microsoft Copilot, all of these things are secured using PowerView. So PowerView has a way that once an organization has done their DLP right, their sensitivity level right, if an organization is using Copilot, Copilot Microsoft um, PowerView will say, okay, Joy has access to this. So guys, you know, Joy shouldn't have access to this because the AI is going to get data from there and give you give Joy and you don't want her so clean up. Like there's so much opportunity learning this skill set, you know, both for Nigeria and outside Nigeria. Um, so because Microsoft is global, so you're learning a skill set that's not limiting you to just your region. But even in Nigeria, I'm saying that there's currently right now the top industries in Nigeria that are paying well and that are looking for IT people because the Jackpot syndrome has taken a lot of us away from Nigeria and our skill sets and skill gaps are open. That's what I say to me. So when people come and say, I personally know an industry where we are 50 something tech people that were in a particular department and we're not in Nigeria. And I told someone, I said, they ha have not filled about 50% of us gap back because it was a skill set. I'm not talking about filling up with people. So I'm saying if you can learn what we knew, it stands you out, right? And there are people that have taken the advantage. It took me five years to get to a particular level in the banking. Some of my mentees are getting there in two years because I'm teaching them that this is what they're looking for. Learn this thing and that's all you need. So you are on the right path. This is one skill set meeting push yourself, cut down on some Instagram time, practice, 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 and you'll be glad you did this in six weeks. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Please stay back if you need help with any other thing. Thank you. Damia, yes, please. Please, please feel free to leave. We, we're done with class. Um, I'm only taking Q&A okay. to help people yeah, with I... any challenge that they have, yeah. Ma, you said something about we can log into Microsoft something learn. So I'm finding it difficult. I don't know if you can. Are you on your laptop, Are you on your laptop or on your phone? Is on my. I'm with my phone. Oh, okay. All right. So go to. Let me use a new account so that I can share my screen. I. So in this account, did you click on the learn? Did, are you are you somewhere like this? He's not the only one who I'm also learning. Yes, so just look at my screen. For all yeah, of you who yeah. could not go to Microsoft Learn, I said that the class that we are going to do for the six weeks, we're going to be using Microsoft Learn. That's where all the course modules. And why I want you to use Microsoft Learn is that Microsoft gives you badges as you complete each module. So that's why I want you to use Microsoft Learn. And as you complete these badges, you can share on any of your social media platform that gives you visibility that you're learning, you know, Microsoft Purview. So it's very important. Now, um, Damian is saying he can't access and so many other people. So this is the step can you all confirm that you have landed on this page whether you're using your phone or your laptop are you on this page and mark and please can the link withdraw so that i can tap it and not it's in the, the it's in the chat group it's in the jonathan dropped it in the chat group
Yes, is William speaking. I can see something like this, but not actually like this one on your screen now. And uh, the one you are seeing, is it showing you Microsoft Certified Information Protection? Um, okay, let's start. Showing, it okay, is showing William. Microsoft 65 Certificate Fundamental. No, 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 no. Did you click on the link that Jonathan dropped in the chat on the Discord channel? Um, Mark, That's fine. Just, seen... click on, just click on Sign In. Okay. Yeah, um, click on Sign In. It's open. Can I type my email account? Now, if you've never created a a microsoft account if you put your email account and say next it might not go so i'm going to do for those who have never used and i'll say create one now when i say create Sorry. one i'm going to put my gmail account here uh, which of my gmail account Sorry, you please i have a question yeah if i have an account in microsoft already do i need to create another one no, just so when you get to sign in, just sign in with that account if you have an account with Microsoft. Okay. So at this place, what it means is that I don't have. So when you are here. Okay. Yeah, once you say sign in from here, it is expecting that you have an account, right? Yeah, so if you don't have an account that works, right? So these are accounts that I have that I've used and I don't want to use any of them. If you don't have an account, it will not show you pick an account. It will just tell you sign in for you to type your email address, right? Like this. This is what it will tell you. This is what it will tell you. So put in your email address. But if you don't have an account that you have used with Microsoft, you can use your Gmail with Microsoft. So if you've never used your Gmail with Microsoft, just say create account and put that your Gmail account. It's also on the Discord group too. Put that your Gmail account and then you say next and it will ask you to create a password. You can use, you know, any password of your choice. And when you go next, it will, it will take you there. Okay. Okay, let's go All right, who has made progress? Are we all fine now? Are we all fine now? Um, thank you so much. I want to just verify is Microsoft Preview the same thing as Azure Preview? Because it seems like um, they are a bit different. I just want to just clarify if they are the same or okay. Microsoft has rebranded Azure Preview to Microsoft Preview. And is it only on cloud services? And can it be used on prem only? Okay. Azure Preview is tied to the Azure right so you know that the microsoft azure is focusing on um more of infrastructure as a service um, platform as a service and the rest right i want to be sure I, I want to know how much you know so that i know how to explain yes 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 i'm very very confident with this i understand what you're saying exactly so the poor view so everything that we are talking about in poor view is extended to the azure side so that's the azure poor view are you getting it? So when yes, you classify, you want to classify your containers, you want to classify your virtual machines, you want to classify your storage. Remember, data is like we said. As long as you're generating data, everybody's everybody's sense, everybody's interested in who has access to what. How do I restrict people from doing this? So on the Azure side, we want to use PowerView too to also enforce those kind of classifications, labels, and information pro protection. So that's the Azure PowerView. Does it make sense now? That's the most yes, simplified way to explain it. Yeah. Um, the second question was. Second question was that can Microsoft Preview be only used on on-prem? So no, due to with extensions, right? Remember, the, when we started the class, we said know your data. So once you're able to identify where your data locations are on-prem, there are some extensions that Microsoft has allowed where you can do 
hybrid extensions and then so you know for instance you can allow yourself to see your file server your file shares that ways you microsoft has allowed you extend those things into your network or if you have some form of um, <coughs> um vpn connection between your on-prem and and azure so you can now do some form of extensive extensibility that english is always struggling i'm always struggling with. that's what microsoft calls it and so you can use that functionality to those data storages that are on-prem it's a bit of design right now we're going real technical so we need to do some bit of solution architecting there where you will come back and say okay my my data source is a file server on-prem or my data source is ABCD on-prem. And then we look for the way Microsoft has made extensions available that we can extend to those points, but they are not just out of the box eh, available. All right, thank you so much. The reason why, yeah. why I raised that was because um, there's a project I'm currently working on and every solution is where all their data is stored is on-prem. They don't do anything cloud-based. So that's what I was more thinking of if this solution can be used strictly on prem. Yeah, yeah, you can you can hit me up on LinkedIn. We can do a bit of solutioning. So once we understand those no data problem. source, now we're going. We we can plot the graph, and then I can tell you what you can take back to them. No problem, no problem. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Osaze, I'm sorry, I'll be calling people that they have. Osaze, your hands are up. Okay. Osaze is not ready. Tell me, talk by your hand is up. Can I, can I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. I just. I just sent a screenshot of what I'm seeing here on the Discord channel. You sent yours on the Discord channel, right? Yes, yes. Okay, why why I'm looking at that? Or oh, Sazet, please you can share your screen so I can see what your issue is. Sorry, let me talk I'm I'm opening my phone now so I can see what you're complaining of. Why we're waiting for Osaze to share his screen. Can you see it? It's coming, yes. Can you see it? It's coming. Okay, Temitokwe, good. So let me be replying Temitokwe or Saze. So Temitokwe, you're on the right path, right? So um, what you have landed on is your activity page on Microsoft Learn. All you need to do is go back to, look at that top right near your name where you have TA. No, all you need to do is, can you click on, on this same browser where you are, can you click on that link that was put by who? Let me see who has who dropped. I think it was Jonathan. I thought to drop the link. And you can click on this one dropped by A Fag by me on Discord so that it's drop because now you're logged in. So click on the one dropped by A Fag by me and it will land you on the Microsoft Certified Information Protection page immediately. Did you get that, Timmy Yes, yes, ma'am. All right. Um, um, Osaze, please, what's the issue? So is this where I should be? Can you scroll up? Let me just confirm. Okay, you sign, yes, you are signed in. Yes, you're signing. So can you click on, can you go to these teams that we are on the chat and look for the link posted by, I just posted it now. So can you click on that one? Just check the chat. Yeah, click on this. So all of you just bookmark your pages once it opens so that you don't have to struggle finding it again look at the bookmark and list here yeah. bookmark this tab yeah done okay your bookmarks don't show let me can you click on the three dotted line beside your yellow icon yes now come to bookmark again come to bookmark don't click yet just say um um show bookmarks the third one This. Ma, please, what if you're having mobile bookmark um, uh, reading lists? What should you do? Just come, um, hold on, Damien. Click on, click on that, please. Go back to bookmark okay. and list. Say, show all bookmarks. Show all bookmarks, yeah. Okay, so yours is showing different. That, that's fine. Yeah, click on, yeah, so click on that all bookmarks. It's not showing. Yeah. Oh, your own went to your sidebar. How do I change? Yeah, but that's it there. The second yeah, one, Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. So scroll down. Scroll down on this page. Yeah, so that's it. So just start by, hold on. Scroll, scroll, just keep scrolling down. Overview. So it's taking you through the overview. Keep scrolling down. Scroll down. Scroll down. And then you start with, that's it. So you start with, um, click on continue course. Yeah. 
to introduction to that's it class classified data for protection and yeah so these are all the costs so we are once i send you guys the sheet you will see um we did classic we didn't touch understand M365 encryption. No, we wanted to do create and manage sensitive information types. And that was, we did classify data for protection and governance. Yeah. So, but this is practically everywhere where you, we are. So once I send the um, cost outline, you see each of the topics and then you know the one to click, but this is each of the models. So we have to complete all of them, right? Uh, I'm saying for the whole six weeks, it's not that you complete them before next week. Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Hello, Miriam, you can go on. Uh, okay, ma. so my own, my own is that I already have um, an MCID. I don't know, saying I should link it to my certification ID or something. I'm not sure I remember setting up the certification ID or if it was set up by a company I was work, working with before. I can't remember. But, but I just wanted to ask you this. That's not necessary can, for the training. Do I need to change it? Okay. No. It's not necessary okay. for what we're doing right now. It's necessary when you want to write the exam, which also okay. is still not an issue. But I'm saying for the training now, all you need is just to go into Microsoft Learn. That's all. All right, guys. Thank you very much and have a wonderful uh, weekend. I'm at, the place. Sorry, Sorry. <laughs> I'm at the place. Sorry. Um, I'm at the place. I'm at the place now. Is is running on, on um, Chrome. So is it that anytime I want to read it, I'll be visiting the browser? Yes, just bookmark it. Yes, it's not an app. Microsoft. Okay, what? Learn doesn't okay, what I tap the, the bookmark. That's all. Yeah, it will open that same page for you, and then you can. You you see your progress. Okay, thank you, Ma. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joy, there was something you said you were going to say about people who are novice in this um, uh, IT, as in something that can help us begin. You said you were going to send something. Your brain is frozen. <laughs> when no, I don't be. I don't yes, you are, are, you are new being IT because I wrote for, for people that are new. I'm trying to remember what I said, which is no, I think I said so. What I normally do is I was like, if if that's not what I said, please correct me. But I think I, I must have said, I'm happy to take the person away from here to just help the person understand how to get into IT. If 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 if, if, if that's not what I said, but I, I would almost say that's what I said. Um, my concern was that if you're new, if if tech is new for you and you just jump on this, it might be a bit overwhelming because if you even look at the course, Microsoft is at intermediate. So for somebody who is totally blank in tech and the person just comes in, the person might say, what do they mean by data? Like it's too much. So I need to, first of all, help the person transition there. That's one. Two, if you've never used Microsoft at all, again, but you are not new in tech, oh, tech is not new. So you understand what data is talking about. You understand when we say data is new, but you've not played around with Microsoft security. Again, it might seem a bit here and there for you. So if you wanted to do compliance hands-on, I would say, okay, there's a Microsoft 365 um, training that just gives you an idea of Microsoft 365 portal. And you know what Microsoft 365 portal is talking about. It's, there's no biggie to it. It's just to give you an idea of how to navigate on the portal and what the portal is talking about. That would be a good place to also adds to this by the time you are done with the program. So it's just so that you can get maximum value from what you're doing. But if you're already in tech, you know what you're doing and data security is, you're trying to break into security, but not even sure if it is data security, then that's fine. This can help you because there's a big deal around data governance, whether Nigeria, whether outside Nigeria, and this tool will help you know how to do it. Okay. Sorry, I want to ask if you can have access to your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, okay, let me drop it for you here. I just dropped my LinkedIn profile on the chat for those who want it, yeah. And again, another good thing with this is even if you don't work for an organization where they can allow you have access to this, but you know a small company 
you have your uncle's company, your auntie's company, your own, your, your school, your cousin's school, your brother. Like I tell people, I say, Microsoft tool is so available. You can start to practice this at any level, just because the concept is the same concept. It's just that if you're in a bigger environment, bigger requirement, smaller environment, smaller requirement, but it's the same thing. What is no data, classify data, protect data, prevent data loss, govern data. It's the same thing. So I talk, I say you can start small. You don't have to say, oh, Joy, um, I'm not working for a bank. You know, I'm working for this small bakery. Um, but you guys take data. Do you guys use Microsoft 365? And I'm telling you things that are, I've, I've, like I, I know people who run businesses that are using Microsoft 365 and they just have a bakery and they just have a restaurant, right? you can do pro bono if it's your cousin uncle just to get your hands familiar with the tool and that experience is all you need to translate into your cv and your profile that we allow the big guys see you so um have a wonderful so, weekend. So I, I, I don't know if this question makes sense the the uh, compliance for microsoft would it be the same as other um cloud service provider like the GRC for Microsoft. Yeah, so so Microsoft is not telling you to comply for the Microsoft is saying you have your GDPR to be compliant to. You have your HIPAA if you're in America, the health. You have your PCI DSS for card related. You have your NIST framework. Whatever is the compliance that you need to adhere to, Microsoft is saying, and you have data within these locations that are Microsoft platforms. We can help you be compliant to them. That's what they're saying. And in fact, from what we saw, Microsoft allows you to also extend to other cloud platforms that you have. So if you say my data is on AWS, my data is on Salesforce, my data is on Google Cloud, Microsoft is saying we can give you some extensions that can help you know if you are compliant there. So, so, so in other words, companies that are not working with uh, Microsoft um, uh, services, we can also um, take the knowledge we get from here and apply to somewhere else. Yes. However, you will not be able to do the hands-on if you don't have Microsoft Purview, but you will understand the concept. So there are two things. When I teach people, I say there are two things about tech, the concept and the hands-on. So when people say I want to get into tech, but they are scared of the hands-on, I say you don't have to be the hands-on if you don't like it. You can understand the concept. So if you're a data protection officer, which is a big deal now, even in Nigeria, you can see the NIPP is coming hands-on on companies now in Nigeria. To be a data protection person, you need to understand data. And that's what we've done in today's class. Tell you that you need to know your data. Then you need to classify your data into different levels of sensitivity. And then you need to come up with protections that will enable you based on those sensitivity levels. Then you need to come up with policies that will prevent data loss and then build some form of governance. You see, all of these things we have said today, we did not use Microsoft Purview to implement them. It's the concept. So once you concept, then Whatever tool you want to use is fine, which is why Microsoft now says, okay, if it is now looking like a big program to do, Microsoft Purview is saying, start with me, use my trainable functionality and scan your environment. But beyond the technology, the concept is what you need to understand so that you can drive a DLP program in any organization you find yourself. So if that organization is purely AWS, do they know where their data is? So as a data security expert, your question is, where's our data? What type of data do we deal with? How have we classified our data? What are the type of labels we want to use to classify our data? Who has access to this data? What time do they have access to the data? How long do we keep this data? What are we doing in place to make sure that people who should not have access to it? Are you seeing all of these things have nothing to do with a technology. By the time you're pushing these security questions and framework into the organizations, then to do it is now where it will not be like, ah, it's too much work. Oh. I need a solution. That's where Purview comes up. But the data security understanding and concept must be what you are pushing as a data security person in your organization. 
And once you are speaking that language, that's where the authority comes in. That's where the respect comes in. It doesn't matter where, whatever tool they want to use to do it. You're standing firm and telling them, GDPR says, if we process this kind of data, we must do this, we must do this. Do we know whether we process this data? Nobody's answering you. You're calling people out and getting them to be accountable because you're telling them this is what we need to do. Our type of business says that we need to do this, we need to do that. PCI, we deal with card-related data. Do we know where we store card? Are we encrypting those cards? ISO 27001 says we need to do this, we need that. Do we know this? Nobody's answering you. That's data security. We're not talking about the tool yet. So, so all we're so doing is... Uh, yes, please, part, go ahead. As part of this um, course, are we going to be learning um, networking? Because that scares me a lot. No. Okay. It's purely Thank data. You. This course is purely how to secure your data. Okay. I don't like network too, but we, we learned it because we needed to do work. Adobe, please, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, again, my own is a different question entirely, but how do people, how can someone working on Saturday actually maximize this class? Um, I'm just grateful that there is a YouTube channel, but what advice would you give? Because I actually work on Saturday, so I've just been in and out, in and out in the class. Okay, what I what you can do is, if you work on Saturday, the truth is you have to plug. I don't know the kind of job you do. Is yeah. it a job that you have to face people, talk to people? Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not able to juggle it. I just come back to listen during my break time, but I've got some free days during the week. But I work on Saturdays, and it's between the my within the hours when the class is ongoing. But you are free within the week, right? Yes. Yes. Joy, 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 joy. Okay. Is it, is it okay to reach out to you personally if I have questions? <laughs> I was struggling that... to see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I just want to ask before I leave, just if the assignment you gave us one time, uh, those of us that are new, is to work on, that is to know more on encryption. So I want to ask mm -hmm. if if we only that one or I should still be reading that book that bookmark just now. No. Um, um for now it's only that one. Um I don't want too much things on you. So focus on since we have a program for six weeks, focus on this. But like I said, anything, any word that is new to you that you're like, what in these people they talk? Like the way it's what you are, I don't know if you did ask me what is E5. Ask me those kind of questions, it's fine. It's not dumb, right? Anything that you see that, I don't, this English, what do they mean here? Ask me, I will explain because it's new for you. Once we're done with the six weeks program, then I will have to drag you to go and do MS 900, which will give you a background about Microsoft's cloud platform microsoft 365 cloud platform and then that can help you make sense of this right and from there you can also decide what you want to do again like i told you we have narrowed down the niche to microsoft when you want to do tech tech is broad but it's always good to narrow down to a solution provider because when you're trying to stand out when everybody's looking for a job you want to say i am familiar with this kind of tool, which most times if an organization is using, then they see you as an asset to them versus I'm just here. But there are certain kind of roles you want to, for instance, if you're looking for leadership roles, don't necessarily have to do the tools, but the concept. So it's here and there. So for both, I'm saying for you, who is an entry level person, for instance, if you apply for any of the graduate training program in the banks or all these companies, you want to be able to show something that you're coming with and you want to say okay, i have skill set here i have skills here and that would stand you out from every other person who would just be coming with that i'm a graduate like i'm a graduate you're a graduate uh -huh. so you would be coming up with you know i understand microsoft platforms and i've deployed this i've done that i've configured this i've run so that will stand you out so that's why driving down to a niche when you're doing tech is good but when you're looking for certain positions, when you begin to go to leadership, is more of do you understand the concept um, to lead? Even if you might think I still do hands on, but talking about concept distinguishes me more as a leader in that space versus dragging technical with everybody. Um, so for you, for now, let's focus 
on this course. So why I call that encryption was that I know that many people, even in tech, when they hear encryption, it's confusing. So I want you to go and read about what encryption means. And I will try and look for very simplified um, blogs that talk about encryption and just drop in the Discord. It's just so that you can say, okay, is this what these people mean by encryption? Okay. Right. Don't worry, thank me, you, man. I look fine. forward to it. All right, thank you, man. Yeah. Bye. Let's say hi to our president. Our president is here. She just joined the class. Hey, Madam Elliot, thank you, Ma, for, for, for just checking up on me. Thank you. She has this thing where she just goes into all the cohort class to just check up on us and make sure we're okay. Thank you so much, Ma. We're done. I just told them to stay back and ask questions for those who have issues that they want us to resolve, but we're done. Thank you so much, um, Joy. I mean, your commitment is incredible. It's only God that can reward you. And thanks to everyone. And please, for this commitment from Joy, try as much as possible to make us happy. Be attentive, attend classes, and write your exams. And of course, by God's grace, we can also recommend you to some amazing local and international jobs. So that's a, that, that, that's a that's 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 the target. That's the target for the for the people who are just building to see how many of them can pick up, even if not for direct employment. Some of us have people who will just say, oh, I need to do this. And by virtue of the job we're doing, we can't do it. We don't mind saying, OK, I can recommend somebody to do this job for you um, because that's what we're seeing in the industry. So um, and that's how textiles are positioned. In fact, in, in the week, we're going to be posting some of textiles people who, by virtue of textiles, they are there, the likes of Rachel, the likes of Faith, the likes of Victoria, they are now technical leads and traveling around the world from textile as what they learned like this. They took it out and they started creating content and visibility. And today, so there are lots of opportunities um, that we bring in textile as, and but it's only for those who are ready to take it and run with. All right, the, we'll take Linus and then I'll, I'll end the meeting. Thank you. Linus, over to you. Okay, thank you for everything. So I just want to know the basic of this um, data security and the basic that I need to focus on now since to this tech stuff. So I want to know the basic I should focus on. Linus, are you the are you the seventeen year old person? Yeah. Okay, so Linus, to be honest with you, I. I don't know if you registered directly or if you're the one who there was a woman who said her child. So I don't know if you're the one or if you, you just saw the portal and registered. To be honest with I you, we have a you registered yourself. No, I registered through textile as same as Damien. Okay. So but because you're 17, you're a student, right? Um enjoy the yeah, class. I'm still, Pardon? I'm still a student, but I'm done with secondary school if I go. Yes, so that's fine. So Microsoft has a student pathway and it's a like if you do it well, you do it well. Like I told you, the three ladies I called their name, we're going to be showcasing them in the coming week. They were all students when they started and a lot of them. But go through these six weeks and get familiar. I After the six weeks, I would, because our community is strictly women focused, so I can't tell you to join the company. I'll send you the student ambassador program for Microsoft and I'm, I'm happy to help you go through it. If you do it well, you will get visibility that will be mind blowing for you, right? Um, so just enjoy the six Swiss course. Why I say you should enjoy it is that when you go into the project, it will help you by the time you are graduating you will be proud of yourself. But once we're done with the six weeks, I'll take you as my case study. I'll give you the student ambassador, Microsoft student ambassador program. It's a program where Microsoft takes you through learning, depending on the path, paths you want to take. They have different of their paths. So data is there, data security is also there, identity and the rest, and they will help you through it. And if you do it so well, they will help you host the program in your school. Like there's so much if you're committed to it. So we can take that. Um, as your second activity after these six weeks, because I'm going to be fully committed to these six weeks. If not, I would have told you we can do it side by side, but I don't have that full capacity now. So let's finish the six weeks program and then I'll specifically put you on the student ambassador program and I'll I'll, I'll mentor you through it. Thank you very much, um, Joyce. Joy, just to add to that, um, 
Linus, this session is actually from 18 to 65. And I like the fact that, you know, you're pushing yourself even at 17. But again, we don't want to slow down the class because six weeks is actually pushing everybody, you know, on a good day. This is like a two months back to back Absolutely. class, right? <laughs> so you having to ask questions all the time because you've not worked with that environment is really going to you know, draws back a bit. So just like she said, just enjoy the class, you know, go and do your research, enjoy this, your period while you're waiting to get into the university in September. But um, after the six weeks, you know, she has also offered to help um, nurture you through this, um, your career path. So thank you. But I mean, it is what it is really, it's from 18 to that age. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Okay, everybody. Bye.